Here we are again. We are in lecture 12 of our series. And what we have been doing is the last uh, few lectures is trying to define observables for our theory. So we define what a cross section is, we define what a decay width was, uh, uh, and also we saw, at least schematically, how to get from green functions in my theory and, and go all the way to the cross section, right? Uh, we have to go through the LLC reduction formula and get these uh, S matrix. Uh, um, elements, which then I can plug into my cross-section formulas and, and calculate scatterings. What might not have been clear so far is that theories that we already quantize, namely what I call the free theories, but uh, there was just a name I gave. What you really know about those theories is just that they uh, had only Gaussian terms in the action. So I remove all the terms with powers of the field uh, greater than two from those actions. Right? What is not clear so far is that those theories cannot actually produce scatterings because there's no interactions there. I, 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 I said that many times, it was implicit in the calculations I did, but I never showed that, right? And now what we want to do is go back to those theories, right? and put no Gaussian terms, which in quantum field theory we, we call the interaction terms, and, and see that they generate scatterings, and then it will become obvious why without them we have no interactions. Right? And, and the first thing I want to do in that direction is to define what, I, what we call the interaction picture. Right? which is a, 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 another picture of quantum mechanics, just like the Heisenberg picture or the Schrodinger picture, but which is uh, very convenient for the kind of perturbation theory we want to do here. Right? I, I indicate some references there, and uh, this is done in Nastasi section 5 and Pesky in section 4.2 and 4.3. Uh, but before, I want to formalize, I mean, do a very quick review of what pictures are in quantum mechanics, because uh, we want to have that uh, very clear, right? And this is very well done in, in Sterman's book uh, on Appendix A, right? So this is a book I didn't mention before, but this is very well done there. So let's start by taking a look uh, and what this pictures of quantum mechanics are. In quantum mechanics, we're always, right, be it when we're looking at transitions or expectation values, we are always interested in objects like this, right? These are the real uh, physical objects of the theory, which will lead is, is, uh, straight into observables, right? These kind of amplitudes, you can take the square of them, they will become probabilities, and then I can uh, look at, uh, at the eigenvalues, probabilities for the eigenvalues of, of operators. And so the, these are the real objects we are interested in. And these operators, of course, are defined in terms of the uh, coordinates of the system. We can be fields, if you're talking about quantum field theory, or position and momenta, if you're talking about uh, quantum mechanics. Right? The evolution, the time evolution of uh, objects like this is totally defined, right? We know that uh, you can write an equation that gives you the evolution of, of this uh, object in time according to the commutator, actually the expectation value of the commutator of that operator A, whatever it is, with the Hamiltonian of the system. And in here, I'm not thinking about a free system, uh, it's just general, a general Hamiltonian. And again, there's no ambiguity here. This is the time evolution of the quantum system, right? There's no choice to be made here. The, the main point is that a lot of the time we're talking about the states separated from an operator, right? We define some, some states, which is usually the eigenvectors of some operator, and we want to know how those states evolve or conversely, we want to know how the operators evolve independent, uh, independently of the states. And when you do that, then you have to make choices, right? To see how 
how you make those choices. Let's separate those evolutions. So I'll define some uh, evolution operators here that evolve either the states or the operators. Let's take an equation for the evolution of the operators, for instance, this one. Right? And here is the total derivative. Right? And I'll define, I use this equation to define some matrix that I'll call M. And this is, whatever this is, this is the, the matrix that evolves the operators of my theory. Right? I can also define an equation for the evolution of the states. And then this equation will uh, define another evolution operator, which I'll call N. Right? And this is responsible for evolving the states in time. Hmm? What I will, I will define this matrix so they, they are Hermitian. And then also for the states, I, I, I can also write, of course, I can take the complex conjugate of, of that equation right? and define also this one psi. Right, actually. Right? So this this defines the evolution of, of the states and of the operators. Now let's put those equations together and see what happens, right? If I write the full evolution of the states and the operator of the actual uh, amplitude. Right? I can write this as, I mean, I can just do the product rule for the derivative and apply it everywhere here. Plus the action on the operator. plus the action on the other state. Right? And then use those definitions I, I have up here to write this as uh, This comes from this equation, right? This is n dagger a psi phi. So phi, also let me fix this. Plus, in here I have the commutator that comes from this one psi. M phi plus uh, psi a n phi, right? And then I can group all of these together and use the fact that these guys are meeting, right? And write these as psi. A, the commutator with a of a with n phi plus this guy here, uh, which of course has to be equal because I started from this equation, right? Has to be equal to the right side of this one, right? So ne this needs to be equal to the same thing but with the Hamiltonian here. Which then shows me, if I compare these two commutators, that N plus M are the Hamiltonian, right? Which at the same time justify this uh, 
uh, this assumption I, I made that these uh, guys are Hermitian, right? And shows that I can do this separation in, in, in many more ways than we usually see, right? It's usual to take M equal the Hamiltonian and N equal zero or vice versa. But you can actually uh, do uh, more complicated choices here because it's, it's, it's basically what you're doing is just dividing the Hamiltonian in pieces that are additive, right? And some of these pieces will evolve states and the other ones will evolve uh, the operators. And that's what pictures are. Essentially, a picture in, in quantum mechanics is a choice of N and M, right? So let's, let's look at a few choices, right? We know uh, which are the popular uh, kids in this, in this picture game. The first is Schrodinger picture, right? which, which is equivalent to the choice of taking M equals zero and N equal the whole Hamiltonian, right? In this case, if I go to these definitions I have up here, I'll always be using these two, right? That will mean that the states, which I'll put an S here just to remember that I'm talking about Schrodinger picture, evolve with the Hamiltonian. And the operators, in this case, in the Schrodinger picture, do not evolve at all. I can solve this uh, first equation to, to get the time evolution of the states. So I know that Psi in, in the Schrodinger picture will be just exponential of, let me get some more space, the exponential of the Hamiltonian, right? Uh, that depends on the time and some initial time that I, uh, this T0 is just a fixed time in, in which I put uh, initial conditions, right? A point in time that I know the state and then I know how to evolve it to another point in time. And this is Psi at this initial time, T0, right? And since the operators do not evolve, right? In the Schrodinger picture, the operator at any time T is just the same as the operator at this uh, initial time. Hmm? So that's how uh, you get the evolution in the Schrodinger picture. The second popular picture is, of course, the Heisenberg picture. Okay, in the Heisenberg picture, the choice I'm making is the opposite one of the Schrodinger one, right? So I'm taking now M equal to the Hamiltonian and N is now zero, right? So in this case, the operators will evolve in time according to, and now H here is for Heisenberg picture, and the operators will evolve according to their commutator with the Hamiltonian and the states will not evolve at all, right? And again, I can solve these equations for uh, the time evolution. In this case, for the operator, which will be just the operator at any time t will be given by the exponential of the Hamiltonian t minus t0. Again, t0 is some fixed reference time, initial time, and this is the operator at that initial time, and of course operators are acted upon from the two sides by these evolution uh, operators. 
Né? And now the states, since they do not evolve, they are just the same as in this initial uh, time. You can see, let me just box this. You can see that I suppressed the Schrodinger here at this initial time. I suppressed it here and I could have suppressed it in here. Because of course, at this initial reference time, it doesn't matter in which picture I am, nothing evolved yet. I can always choose one point in time and make the two pictures coincide at that point. So by definition, when I say uh, Psi S of that T0 is the same as uh, Psi H at T0, which I'll just, I'm just calling Psi at T0. And the same for the operators, right? I'm doing the same game for the operators. And uh, there's always a, a, a point in time where I can do that, right? And you have seen me using that when I was, if you go back to where I, I was doing the S matrix, I did that too. Hmm? Other than that, if I want to, co in any other point in time, except this one, if I want to convert from one picture to the other, there's a unitary transformation that does that, right? We know that if you take a state Let's call it Psi W, which is defined by W acting on Psi. And this W is unitary. So W dagger is equal to W minus one. Right? Then uh, I, I can go from one picture into another. Say, let's, let's say, I define W as the transformation that takes me from Schrodinger picture into the Heisenberg picture. Then you can see that uh, the operators in the, for instance, in the Heisenberg picture are just written as these in terms of this initial time. But we know that this is also the operator in the Schrodinger picture because they never change from this initial one. And that means W, in this case, that, that goes from Heisinger to, to Schrodinger is just this exponential. So essentially W is either, uh, uh, it's the evolution itself, right? It's either this one or minus this one, depending if you're going from Schrodinger to pick to, to Heisenberg or vice versa, right? This one is defined in the way, right? And I could obtain the same thing from the, the, the equation for the states, right? We know that in the Heisenberg picture, the states do not evolve, so they can be right as an evolution uh, the opposite of the evolution, actually acting on the Schrodinger states, Schrodinger picture states, right? And then write Psi Schrodinger of T is W minus one acting on Psi Heisenberg of T, right? Which is the same as Psi T zero, right? We make makes it clear that W minus one must be this guy. T minus T zero acting on Psi of T zero because we know how Schrodinger states evolve, right? I'm just using this equation, right? And identifying this as W minus one. This guy is, is, is usually called the evo uh, evolution, since it evolves states in the Schrodinger picture, is all, uh, usually called the U-S-U because it's unitary, but we 
we use that a lot for the evolution, right, from T0 to T. So I use this notation a lot. It's good to keep that in mind. So it's pretty easy to go from Schrodinger to Heisenberg. And also remind, since we're defining U like that, it's important to remind that then U S minus one, if I change times, right? That uh, gives me the inverse, right? Because this is uh, a unitary operator. So exchanging the times is the same as taking the dagger and taking the dagger is the same as taking the inverse of this operator, right? So this property is, is, is pretty useful to us. We, we, we use it a lot, right? So, so this evolution operator will be important. So the reason I, we, we're going through this review of the Schrodinger and Heisenberg picture is because I, I want to define a new picture different from these two, right? And what is called the, let me copy this, the interaction picture. So let's see what the interaction picture is and why is, is it useful, right? Let's see its proper properties. So interaction picture. So the idea here is that in many interesting cases for us, we will have a, Mut a Mutonians which have the following structure. Right? The Hamiltonian can be written as a sum of some H naught plus some H1. Right? What is H naught? H naught is what I have been calling the free theory. So this is just the quadratic or Gaussian, right? Part of, 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 of the Hamiltonian. This is, contains only the quadratic terms in the fields and uh, and is what I call free theory. And I'm leaving here everything with higher powers of the fields, right? which I'll soon show that is connected to an interacting theory. So in the interaction picture, what I'll do is that I'll choose M to be the free or Gaussian or quadratic part of the Hamiltonian to be, to be M, right? And N will be the interacting part or the higher powers, the non-Gaussian, non-Gaussianities in, in my uh, Hamiltonian. Hmm? That means that in, the, in this interaction picture, the operators, the operators evolve with M, right? So I'm now using I to indicate interaction picture. And the operators will evolve as in the free theory. So they will, they will evolve with the only the free part of the Hamiltonian. The states, however, will be evolving with the other part, with H1. It, uh, there's a co important comment here that you, you need to be careful with the notation. Right? Some books actually use, instead of a one here, use I to say the interacting part of the Hamiltonian. And then it gets confusing this I here. This The, the I that is here is the picture and I'm using H1 to indicate the interacting part of the Hamiltonian. So don't, don't mix those two or, or you could uh, have a lot of confusion. Again, in the same way I did before, I'm assuming that some at some initial uh, reference time, T0, right, all the pictures coincide. So 
I'll do the same I did for the Schrodinger picture and the Heisenberg picture. That means that the interaction picture operators will be just this, right? At time t0, which is also the same for Schrodinger or Heisenberg, right? And the same for the states. So at that initial time, all pictures coincide. Which is a very convenient choice. Let's look how the evolution is in this new picture we are defining here. So for the operators, they will all evolve according to the free uh, Hamiltonian. That means that the Hamiltonian itself, right, if I take the free part of the Hamiltonian, since, since it commutes with itself, right, that evolution is trivial, right? So the free part of the Hamiltonian in the interaction, so zero for free, I for interaction picture, does not evolve at all. So it is the same as in the Schrodinger picture, which is convenient, right? Now, all the other operators, and that includes the, um, the interacting Hamiltonian, the interacting part of the Hamiltonian, will have an evolution given by this equation, which means that they will have a time evolution that looks like, like this one. So this is the evolution of all the operators. They look just like uh, the one in the Heisenberg picture, but uh, using only the free Hamiltonian. What about the states? Right? So the states, for the states, the situation is a little bit more complicated because before I had a solution to this equation up here, right? But that solution is only valid if this operator is also not evolving in time. And now we know that H1 is actually evolving just like this. So the solution to this equation is more complicated, right? I want, what I want to find is some evolution operator that is in this form, right? So this is a formal solution to that. So I have a time evolution operator in the interaction picture that depends on the time I evolved to some initial time, right? Psi of t0, right? I want to find who this guy is. It's, and it's not just the exponential of h1. Right? <clears throat> and I want this guy to have the normal um, properties. I mean, the the usual properties for a time evolution. So, for instance, the time evolution from one time into itself, right? The same time here should be one, right? And also a composition of time evolution. So, if I apply two evolutions in sequence, right? This should be just the evolution from t0 to t. Right? So the, those are properties I want of, of this operator. And I need to solve that equation uh, in order to get that, right? So what I'll do is I'll substitute this up here. Right? I'll take this guy and put this on, on both sides of the equation. What I'll get is that I, D, D, T of U, I, T, T0, Psi, interaction picture, at T0, of course that coincides for every picture, is equal to H1, 
in the interaction picture that depends on time, right? So H1 is evolving on time. U, I, T, T0, Psi, I, T0. Right? So this is the equation I have. And of course, I can translate that into an uh, equation for the operators. Right? So I take this is equal to this, since it is the same state on both sides. Uh, and should be valid for any initial condition of this state, right? And, and then one simple solution to this equation is not the most convenient form, but it is a solution and it's easy to check that it is one, is just that ut t0 is equal to the exponential of i h0. So h0 is the free part of the Hamiltonian, the Gaussian part of the Hamiltonian. Exponential of minus i h h Schrodinger, right? t minus t0, right? Where h uh, Schrodinger here is actually the full Hamiltonian in the Schrodinger picture. So H is H0 plus H1 and this is in, in, is in the Schrodinger picture. Right? And you can see why this is not a very convenient solution. I have things mis, uh, mixed in, in, in different pictures here. But it is a in, uh, it is a solution and we can now work on making it look better. To prove it is a solution, what we can do is actually just do the derivatives, right? So if I take the dt of ui dt0, this is, I have to apply the derivatives here, right? So uh, on the first part, I just have a h zero, and this guy does not evolve, right? So it is the same as in the Schrodinger picture, right? Because it does not evolve at all uh, in the interaction or the Schrodinger picture. So I'll put Schrodinger just to make the same as this one. Exponential of i h naught t minus t zero exponential of minus e h s t minus t zero plus i h naught t minus t zero um, minus i h s exponential of minus i h s t minus t zero right which then i can combine right because this commutes with this exponential right because it's just uh the same hamiltonian so i can actually bring it here right and write spon this exponential to the left this one to the right and combine the two in the middle right this will be just minus i exponential of i h naught t minus t zero and in here I have h Schrodinger minus h naught Schrodinger right, that's why I have this minus here so it's positive here and negative there and to the right I have this other exponential it just comes here <clears throat> just comes over here right? and of course this is uh, I'm taking the full Hamiltonian the Schrodinger picture and subtracting the free one what I have here is 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 the interacting one in the Schrodinger picture right which is the same as the interacting one calculated at this initial time because it does not evolve 
in the Schrodinger picture. So, now, um, I can write this as minus i mm, and, and, and here I have to be careful because I want to bring this H1 interaction over here, right? But I have, I have Schrodinger there. So what I'm doing here is actually remember that uh, the H1 in the interaction picture, let me, let me do it like that. So the H1 in the interaction picture is the exponential of a i h naught t minus t zero h one of t zero exponential of minus i h naught t minus t zero. That means I can bring this. I can invert that relation, right? And, and bring this exponential here and this one here this guy is this guy here right if I substitute it over here I'll have this exponential concealing this one and this one is left to the right and I have so if I take this expression and use it here, what I'll have is minus i h1 in the interaction picture, right? because this exponential concealed with this one, but I still have this one, right? which I put to the right here, and this one, I'm just repeating it, here, a little bit outside of the screen, which is not very good for people watching the movie, the video, right? And this is U I T T zero, which proves my equation, right? So, I show that d dt of u is minus i h1 interaction u. I just have to bring this i to the side and I, I have proven my equation. So, this is a solution. Right? It's not a very convenient solution though. What, the kind of solution we would like, right? Because it's very similar to what we had before it was something like that right that would be the simple solution that we would love to see evolving states we cannot get that but we can get something uh, something similar right something a little bit more complicated but still useful let me propose a new form for ui and then we'll show that it is also a solution to the equation above, right? So we're looking for solutions to this equation, right? Because as long as, long as this is true, uh, we know that states will evolve like that because th this comes from this equation. So all I have to do is propose a new form for UI and then prove this is true. Right? Uh, and this form is a little bit no intuitive, but you see where it comes from. So, let me write this in something that is very reminiscent of a series for exponential, but we, with one important difference. dt1h uh, 1i of t, right? So far, so good is looking very much like what we want, but now the tricky part comes around. Okay. Min minus i, i squared, square, 
integral from t0 to t dt1 and here and here's the point t1 goes into the limit you see t0 dt2 right which means t2 is always smaller than t1 it goes at at, at, at maximum it's equal to t1 it's, it's less than or equal to t1 right and then i have h1 i t h1 i oops t1 t2 right? it would be just the the expansion for the exponential if not for this ordering that I'm putting here. And remember, these guys are all operators. And of course, the next piece that won't fit there, I'll put down here, is minus i cube, dt1, t0 to t, dt2, t0 to t1, that's the important part, d t3 goes from t0 to t2 so t3 is always less than or equal to t2 t2 is less than or equal to t1 right but in here i just have the product of three h of t1 t t2 and t3 ordered in that way right so one two three because they are operators they do not commute with each other hmm? At different times, they do not commute with each other. So, let me prove first that this is actually a solution to that equation. Right? For that, I just have to do the time derivatives. Right? So, uh, the per first part is trivial. Right? This I'll call the zero order term. Right? Uh, and if in this is the first this is the second and so on right the point is that the, making the derivative of one will get me just minus i h one i calculated at time t right? times of course times one but this is just to prove my 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 point Right? If I do if I do d dt of the second term here, right? I have this whole function that only depends on t calculated at, at point t, which means this will be just minus i integral of t zero. So I substitute t one right by t to t d t two h one i of t um, h one i of t two, right? And then of course t two is just a, a, a integration variable, so I can substitute it for t one and recognize that what I got is minus i h one i t times this a term that is just like this one and so on and so forth if i do if you come to the third term and do d dt of the third term here this one you get minus i h one i of t times the second term and all through the series that goes all the way to infinity right so term by term this is satisfying this equation right when i do the time derivative i get minus i times h one i of t right? so this is a solution so this strange form with the integrals here is a solution and i have shown that the dt of u written in this, that way ui written in that way is actually minus i h one i t 
times u i t t zero. Right? Fine. So my new ansatz here is good, right? But is that any better than this? Right? This is a good question. It doesn't look much better. Now I have an infinite series. The point is I can organize this series and resum it if I do a little trick with the integrals, right? What we would like to have is uh, limits to these integrals uh, that all have just the same time up here, right? This is very similar to one of the exercises we did with the force harmonic oscillator with the very important difference that now we have operators here. Right? In there we had functions. And, and these operators you need to be careful with. So essentially what I want to do right now, think it's easier to think of the two-dimensional integral, this one. Right? right now what I'm doing is I'm integrating T1 uh, T2 right? and I'm integrating T1 from t0 to t, but I'm integrating uh, t2 just from t0 to, let me use a different color, t0 to t1. So I'm taking uh, a triangle here, right? I'm only integrating in here. But I want to make T2 go all the way to T. Let's pretend that's a straight line to here. And I want to take the upper part of this triangle too. Right? That's what I, I want to have. Right? But the problem is I have to remember that H1I T1 does not commute with H1I T2, because these guys evolve, right? This guy, in the interaction picture, the Hamiltonian, the interaction Hamiltonian is evolving, and so this is not zero, right? The, the trick I can use here is, is one that already appeared quite naturally in another context. Let's notice the following. If I take this integral, now I'm writing the full, the integral over the full square there, t, dt1, integral from t0 to t, dt2. But instead of writing, writing just the product of these two operators, I write the time-ordered product, right? You see, you, you can already see where I'm going with this, right? So if I write the time ordered product here. This product is by definition, right, let's call uh, the bottom triangle A and the top one B. In region way A, which I can write in my integrals as t0 to t, dt1, t0 to t1, right? That puts me in region way A, dt2. Since in this region, since t2 is always smaller than t1, there is no ambiguity on the time ordering product. It will always be equal to just that, right? Now, in the other region, region B, and this is equal to these two parts, right? I can write B as the integral from T0 to T0 to T, dt2. I'm writing it 
Now T2 in region B is going all, always from T0 to T, right? And it is T1 that is going just from T0 to T2. That describes that integral in region B. And again, now T1 is always smaller than T2, so the time order product will be always equal to this. Right, the time order product is always this ordering now. This is triangle B. But you see, in the way I did the parameterization of triangle B, it is clear that as I can just rename variables here, T1 by T2, and this is just two times the same integral, right? This is just two times this, this first integral here. Which means that I can write this integral that I had at the start here in my definition of u1, this one, as half the integral over the full square as long as I substitute this product by the time ordered product. This is uh, identity, right? And, oh, of course, it's not that easy to see for, three di for the three-dimensional case because then you have six regions, right? But, but it is true that I can do that for, for all of them. And in general, I can write the same logic, right? I just write in more pieces, right? And, and, and I can write that the integral from t0 to t dt1 d t n so I'm, I'm taking all the variables from t0 to t so this is the equivalent of the square but in now uh, hyper volume right of t and I have a time ordered product of h1i t1 all the way to h1i t n this is n factorial times, let me put this factorial here, times the integrals in, done in another way. t, dt1, t0, t1, dt2, t0, tn minus 1, d t n of h one i t one h one i t n right the way to show this is just by you do for two three four and you convince it yourself that this is true for n right and that means I can go back to my uh integral here right this one and and make the substitution so i just remove this and divide by two factorial i take one one and two out of here and i get a three factorial and i do that for the whole series now it looks even more like exponential series right but with always every time i do that i have to always uh, also put a time ordering here that's the price i pay right and we have a name for this exponential it's not exactly the exponential because of the time ordering right but amazingly we we call this the time order the exponential right it's a very uh, creative name for it the way we uh, indicate this is just this one.
right? Don't don't read too much into this notation. Like the T goes inside. This means this, right? A series, uh, it's just like exponential series, but each term of the series, the operators that appear here appear multiplied at various times and time ordered, right? Uh, time ordering does nothing with the, the, the integral. It's just this means the series I wrote above. Hmm? And this looks a little bit more with what we wanted, right? We wanted something without the time ordering, and we see that we have to pay the price of time ordering to have um, an evolution operator that looks like exponential. There's another detail we need to be careful about when uh, making this separation between uh, the the free part of uh, of the theory and uh, the interacting one, right? So uh, we had defined the lowest uh, lying state of the theory in energy as the vacuum, right? And 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 this is the guy that has the smallest energy, or just called E zero to indicate. Uh, the f and uh, let's put free here. Just uh, the lowest lying lying energy of the free theory, right? And if I did normal ordering, I can define this to zero. So this number is just zero, and I'm counting energies in relation to that. So this is an eigenvalue to h naught, right? Uh, and that it was fine. Now with the interaction Hamiltonian, right? Uh, I can also define a state which is the state with the lowest energy of the system, right? This, by definition, is E0 omega. And this is what defines... This is what defines omega. This equation defines omega, right? but now E0 is an eigenvalue uh, of H0 plus H1. It is not clear that we can solve these and find omega and find uh, these energies. We know that in, in general this is hard to do. The important thing is that one vacuum is not like the other vacuum, right? So we have to be careful about that. And we would like to write our theory in terms of this guy, because the, this guy we know the properties and we know um, how to work with him. Right? And we can take one into another, maybe perturbatively. Right? So let's try to make an effort in that direction. Right? So if we take the total Hamiltonian, we can always, and that we can always do, uh, write uh, Hilbert space of the eigenstates of energy, right? of the Hamiltonian. Let's call that like this. I'm, I'm, I'll use F if it is just the free Hamiltonian. In general, N here means now the full Hamiltonian, and these are states of energy. Right? I know that these vectors form a basis, and I have a completeness uh, relation that it looks like this. And just to be uh, uh, careful here, right? N sums over whatever many states that can be in this theory. Right? I'm not saying E1 is different from E2 or 3 I'm summing, I'm, I'm taking all indexes and projecting them into just one index. There. So this is pretty general, right? 
And let's think about now of about a state. Let's suppose I had the power to turn the interaction on and off. So I could just turn H1 off and allow the system to go into the vacuum. So I'm starting from a state that at some initial time is the vacuum of the free theory because the interactions are just turned off. And then I go and I turn on the interaction and I look and I let it evolve, right? Since this vacuum is not this one, it, it will start changing once I turn the full Hamiltonian and it will evolve according to this operator, right? So this is the full Hamiltonian and uh, the state is now evolving in the uh, Schrodinger picture, right? So I'm putting the full Hamiltonian here and let's see what happens. Hmm? If I insert this identity right here, right? Take this, this identity insert right there. What I'll get is vacuum, vacuum. plus the sum for n different than zero exponential of minus i h t n n. And since these guys are eigenvectors of the full Hamiltonian, right, by definition, this just becomes the lowest line energy and this becomes En. And then let's now see what happens if I take this time to be very big, right? But also I do shift it, uh, shift a little bit into the complex plane. So I'm taking it slightly imaginary out of the real x in a particular direction. So this sign is very significant, right? And I'm, I'm taking time to be very big along this slightly imaginary, epsilon is small and, and positive, right? Real number. And, and what happens when I do that is that if I substitute this I'll have the oscillating exponentials as usual, but now I also have a, a, another exponential that is the imaginary part of, of the time, right? Which will look like, in this case, for instance, I'll get a component that is minus epsilon E0t. In here, I'll have exponential of minus epsilon E1t, exponential of minus epsilon E2 T, huh? I'm using capital T here because I'm taking this to infinity, right? And, it, and of course, since the energies are increasing, I know for sure that this guy is much bigger than this one, right? If E1 is also bigger, if the second level is not degenerate, E1 is also much smaller than this guy. But you know, at, at most they will be degenerate and be equal, but then they'll be much bigger than the next guys and so on and so forth. What I know for sure is that my vacuum will dominate, right? As t goes to infinity, the whole series will be dominated by just this first term. That means I can write uh, this as the limit. So, the limit of t going in that particular direction of the evolution of this state that started with a 
the free theory vacuum will be related to the vacuum of the interacting theory in a very particular way. Very particular way. So you see, this limit was designed to find a relation between the free theory vacuum and the interacting theory vacuum. Hmm? Now let's improve these, right? I'll, I'll take this matrix element, throw it to the other side. I'll take this exponential, I'll also bring it to the other side and write omega, which is the guy I don't like and I want substituted in my expressions as, well, it's hard to write omega for some reason as um, the limit of t going to infinity, infinity 1 minus i epsilon of what is on this side, the exponential of minus i h t 0 exponential of minus i e0 t omega 0 right and, and and now i just shift it a little bit because it's convenient for me i'm not doing nothing i'm doing nothing right i'm just shifting uh, in time since this is infinity, it won't make any difference. To add a t0 here and a t0 here. Why well, is the same? I could have I could have this plus t0 from the start there. It wouldn't change anything. Right? But this helps because I can now identify uh, a familiar guy for us. Right, let me move this here. This is the same to horse. But in the numerator here, I'll add a new piece. So this exponential stays the same. But I'll add an exponential of i h not. Remember, these are all operators. I'm not always writing the operator symbol, but we're dealing with operators here. Right? And this is h not t plus t zero. This piece I can add freely because this guy is an eigen state of the free Hamiltonian with eigenvalue zero. So H not acting on zero is zero, right? I'm, I'm assuming my Hamiltonian is normal order. So I got rid of zero point energies. And, right? Now this is very familiar. Remember that we had the definition of u i of let's say minus t t zero but we had just t t one here right as the exponential of i h naught minus t minus t zero i'm just plugging in the definition we had above times the exponential of the full Hamiltonian in the Schrodinger picture, and we're doing Schrodinger picture all along here, t minus t0, and, and we also know that one of the properties we demanded for this guy is that minus t, t0, ui, t0 minus t is equal 1, which together imply that ui 
of t0 minus t is the exponential of plus i h minus t plus oops minus t0 exponential of minus i h not minus t minus t0 which is what i have here right here right with the exception of i have to oh it's the same right even the signs if i bring the sign outside i have it here the sign outside i have it there so i have exactly this term up here right? so what i'm saying is remember this is omega so i actually have shown that omega is the limit of u i t zero minus t vacuum and this is some normalization down here i'll explain it in a bit t plus t zero omega and this is important let me put a box around it and we'll discuss it a little bit so what i what i have shown here what i have shown here is that i can write uh, the vacuum of the interacting theory in terms of the vacuum of the free theory and one is the evolution of the other according to that evolution operator in the interacting uh, interaction picture right that brings uh these this guy that was the vacuum in some distant past of course i'm, I'm taking time it's slightly imaginary to make things converge right but i'm bringing this vacuum asymptotically free vacuum so it's the free theory in the infinite past into some uh, vacuum at this time this initial time t0 where which is the time i, I use to match all, all all the pictures right i i could have put any time here right so this t0 appeared here when i did this shift i can i could put any time that i wanted here important time the important thing is i'm bringing the asymptotically free vacuum from the past into the present which is defined by wh whatever time i choose to be t0 right and i could have done the opposite right i could just take the dagger of this expression or do the whole proof again and show that the vacuum on this side is the limit of t going to infinity one minus i epsilon it's the same limit by the way because i changed the sign of the times here u i t sorry big t so it's not minus t you see whatever sign that you intuitively might expect here is actually in here t zero over exponential of minus i e zero t minus t zero zero omega right which is the same it also also tells me that i can write the vacuum of the free theory asymptotically right i can i can take uh, write the vacuum of the full theory as uh, asymptotically going to the vacuum of the free theory in some distant future right these two expressions are very important right and 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 they deserve some discussion it is important to wonder what are we doing here right what what the hell right and and again the image we have right is very similar to the one we explored when talking about uh the cross sections right so 
we, we're dividing essentially our uh, scattering in three different moments. There's some distant past in which some particles are approaching each other. They are all moving towards some region where the scattering will happen, right? But at this initial point, they are not interacting. They are far apart, right? And they are distant enough from each other and from the interaction point that there is no overlap and I can treat them as free. So initially I have the free theory. Uh, and then there is some interaction uh, region and this region I have very little information about it. It's all protected by the uncertainty principle, right? I don't know exactly the point in which the interaction happened because these, these, these particles have fairly well defined momenta. That means they are fairly well spread in space, right? And I also don't know exactly the time it happened, right? Because again, the energy of the particles are well, uh, fairly well uh, determined, right? But whatever happens there, there is a scattering. Afterwards, I see particles going away from that region that uh, are also free, right? And most I have some external field, right? Usually I can, I can have some magnetic field directing these particles to each other, but this is classical external field. Right? Whatever it does is only changing the classical trajectory of the, the particle. It's not exchanging high energy uh, photons, say, with these particles. It's, it's not behaving in a quantum mechanical way. So essentially just changing, let's call it geodesics of, of, of the particle and not really changing its properties. So I have these three distinct moments, right? And, and the interaction picture is very convenient for dealing with that because the free part of the Hamiltonian, the one that fixes, let's say, the properties of the particle, the mass, uh, the dispersion relation, is not changing in time because the free Hamiltonian is not evolving. On the flip side, the interaction is, that means I can actually make the interaction be zero at the start be zero at the end and be different from zero in the interaction region because the interacting part of the Hamiltonian is changing in time. It's evolving in time, right? And, uh, and, and, and that's why the interaction picture is very useful, right? And you, you can see that here, right? You can see that you can start with a syntotically free theory finish with an asymptotically free theory, but have an interacting one at time t0, right? And, and, and we'll use that a lot. Now we want to see what happens with the green functions of this theory, right? The endpoint functions. And in order to do that, let's rem remember that we have uh, defined our fields, right? We define, define the field operator in the Heisenberg picture because time was here, right? This is actually phi of tx. So we have been using implicitly Heisenberg picture operators. And now I want to move into the um, interaction picture. Hmm? And, and to do that, I, ha I have to establish the relation between the two. I'll drop this hat notation for a while because, well, I'm not very good at this notation. I keep forgetting it. But uh, keep in mind, we're dealing with operators here, right? So uh, we know that in the Heisenberg picture, these guys evolve uh, with the full Hamiltonian. So this is just I H t minus t0 phi of t0 x exponential of minus i h t minus t0 and this is that reference time time where all all pictures coincide 
By contrast, in the interaction picture, the evolution is just with, uh, with the free Hamiltonian. So this is I H one. So the, oh, oh, this is the interaction in the H zero T minus T zero. Same thing, initial uh, operator exponential of minus i h not t minus t zero right and now i can use those two to write uh, the interaction one in terms of the heisenberg one uh, however i like right I'll, I'll, I'll do the following i'll just take this equation and isolate phi of t zero x which will be equal to this Heisenberg picture operator with this exponential to the left and this one to the right. And I will substitute this in here. So in this case, I can write phi interaction picture as this. This guy in the middle will come from the inverse inversion of this equation so i'll have this exponential to the left i h t minus t zero uh, this guy in the middle phi h t x um fine and 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 this guy on the right exponential i h t minus t zero and finally this one right so this is the same as this in yellow here right just coming from that equation and we we know this these evolution operators here we have defined them before these are just the interaction picture uh, operators right in here I have u i dagger of t t zero. Right? So that's the relation between the interaction and the uh, Heisenberg pictures. I want the inverse of that. So what I'm really after here is just phi Heisenberg of x. It's equal to u i dagger t t zero phi i x and u i of t t zero so this is what we were looking for and now i can use this right i can put these into my uh, endpoint functions and and see how the endpoint functions look in the interaction picture of course, we want to start with the simplest uh, endpoint function, which is the two-point function. So something like that. Now in the full theory, so it's omega time order product of phi x phi y. But since it is a headache to work with the time order product all the time, I'll just take for now x0 bigger than y0 see what happens and then later i can do the other option right i can do x0 bigger than uh, y0 bigger than x0 later and see what i get on the other side okay. so for now i'm using this one so we know expressions for everyone here right we we know how to write omega in terms of the free theory vacuum in the interaction picture and these two guys are these heisenberg right there's an implied heisenberg picture here right and i use this expression for x and for y so let's do it for the omegas i'll get this limit right of t capital t going to infinite in a particular way right 
and that allows me to write omega as the free theory vacuum ui of capital T, T0, over exponential of minus i, E0, capital T minus small t0, and some projection here. Hmm? Then that's omega right here. Then phi of x, I'll write like this. So it's u i dagger x zero t zero phi i of x u i x zero t zero. That's phi of x. Then I need to do phi of y. I'll continue down here will be u i dagger of y zero t zero phi i y u i y zero t zero and finally the other omega the limit is already here so I can just put the rest the, the, the rest of the expression t0 minus t0 exponential of minus i e0 capital T plus t0 omega 0 right so this is the whole expression that I get right so now I can use some properties of the evolution in the interaction picture which allow me allow, allow me to to simplify things a lot here the first one we already know that u i dagger of t t prime is u t prime t we have seen this before and this is just take the dagger of the definition and you see that and another one is that the composition right of t t0, u, t0, t1 will be just u, t, t1, right? These two together allow, allow me to do a lot of things, a lot of things here, because look, if I take this dagger out, t0 comes to the left, and then I can combine this evolution with this one to get just one evolution that goes from x0, that will be on the right, all the way to t. So t0 goes away here, I just get evolution from x, 0 to t. Same here, this guy times this one, once I take the dagger, t0 comes from the left, left, and I get evolution from y0 to x, and the same here, right? This is actually already in the right order. Huh? So t0 is disappearing. In the denominator here, see that this exponential, the part that involves capital T, has the same sign. But the, 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 the part that involves T0 has opposite signs. So T0 goes away, right? as it should, because this T0 is just some arbitrary time I'm choosing anywhere that where, where I make all the pictures match. The, of course, the final answer should not depend on this guy right, at all. Right? The, it can only depend on, on the actual time coordinates that uh, belong to X and I mean X0 and y0 right so using that i can write this as a nice little story right you see i got this limit right here uh, let me gather these normalizations that are left here so this is minus i 2 e 0 capital t and this guy together with that one give me the the modulus square of that uh, of that uh, amplitude that, right there okay? but the rest of the the sequence of operators now is just zero ui from capital t to x zero phi i of x evolution from 
y0 to x0, phi of y, evolution from minus t to y0, vacuum. And you see why I'm saying calling this a story, right? Because the same way I started with uh, with the times ordered here, they end up ordered here in every manner, right? I start from the distant past, I evolve this vacuum from the distant past to uh, I state that is now in, in, from the interacting theory at y. I apply this operator. The resulting state is then evolved to a time x0. When I apply this other operator, the resulting state is then evolved into the distant future and projected into the vacuum of the free theory. Right? It's all nicely time ordered here. Right? I can improve this by getting rid of these normalizations. I, I, you can see that I don't have to worry about that. Or at least I can exchange these strange uh, normalizations, but by one that is more, more intuitive to us which is this one, right? This is what you would expect from the vacuum of the interacting theory, even if you don't know how to get this vacuum, how to solve the interacting theory, you want it to be normalized, right? And I can write this normalization using the same expression. I just have to calculate the same thing without the phi's. And if I do that, right, without these phi's here, all these u's come together and I get just the one uh, evolution, right? Let's see, let me put the limit here. Let me put the normalization here because those are exactly the same, right? But now without the phi's, if I didn't have these two fields here, then I can bring all these uh, evolutions together and disappear with x0 and y0 and get just zero u i t minus t right I, I, all i have to do is do the same i did above i'll use this expression and this one and these two uis will have nothing in the middle so they'll come together and bring uh, and bring me this evolution which then i can isolate and and substitute here, right? I, or in other words, I can just divide this expression by this one, which is one, right? So I can just divide this by one, written in this way. All these normalizations go away because they are divided by each other, and I'm left with a ratio between these two guys, right? Which which is what I want to write for now. This one. Right, let me do it. So omega, phi of x, phi of y, omega, the limit, these go away and I have the ratio between the other two. This divided by this. Perfect. So this I want to save. Now, as I said, that's only the first step. The second one would be to do for y bigger than x, but then the object I would be calculating would be the same thing, but with phi y to the left of phi x, and now with the opposite ordering here, and I mean, everyone can see that I get exactly the same expression. Just take this one and replace all x's by y's and vice versa. Right? It's the same expression. And, and Again, it's time ordered, right? Because now x is smaller than y, x will always be to the right of the y's here. And, and again, I get, if I, 
uh, I, I get a time ordered on the right. So if I do in general, right, I can write this in general, right, I can just put the time ordering on both sides. Right? I have proven it for the two cases that can arise in here. Of course, if I have more operators in the middle, it's more work because I, I have to prove more and more orderings. But that's the way you can show that if you start with the ordering on that side, you always end up with the time ordering on this side too. Right? And, and, and that's uh, the important thing because once I put these operators inside a time ordering, I know they will be applied in a time ordered way. Even these UIs, we know that these UIs, one of the ways we can write them is as the time ordered exponentials. So there will be just power series in the Hamiltonian and, 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 and whatever time uh, each of these uh, powers of the Hamiltonian appear, they will be applied in the end between these two states in, in the edges here in a time ordered manner. And that means I don't have to write them as this. Now, now that I have the time ordering operator that applied to the whole product, I can write things inside this product in any order I want. I know how they will be applied uh, in the end, right? And that means I can actually take the simplify the expression, right? Now I'm not doing anything, but I can simplify the expression a lot because I can bring these operators here. I know the order they will be applied, right? And use again the property and disappear with x0 and y0 explicitly from the equation. Of course, they are still here, right? And the, the final answer depends on x0 and y0. I'm just hiding them. It's not the same as t0, right? Uh, and, and if I do that, right, I end up with this guy, right? Just evolving from minus t to plus t. Right? And, and that means now that I can write this expression in a very famous way, which is this. Zero time ordered product of phi i of x phi I have to remember that on the right side of these equations I have interaction picture on the left side I have Heisenberg since we always worked with Heisenberg I'm suppressing Heisenberg but I want to keep the interaction one explicit right so phi i of y and then the ui from minus t to t, which I'll write as the time ordered exponential. Since I already have the time ordering here, I won't repeat it here, right? The time ordering of the time ordering is a time ordering. <laughs> so minus i from minus infinity to infinity. I mean, these times are big. dt, the interacting Hamiltonian in the interaction picture t and then I close the time ordering and the bracket and I have a similar thing in the denominator now I write this explicitly as the time ordered exponential of the same let me try to just copy this here And let me put a box around this one too, because it's a very important one. So now you can start to see uh, what's the advantage, the, the big advantage of the interaction picture, because now this exponential is a power series 
in the interaction, right? I cannot do with the interaction exactly. We already know that, right? I mean, from quantum mechanics, right? The moment I go away from the harmonic oscillator, the Gaussian part of our, our actions, you find problems. Right? But if this interaction is small in some way, right? Remember, I have operators here. This is an operator. This is an operator. This is an operator. But if if there's anything in in any sense, I can truncate these uh, insertions of the interaction. Then maybe there's a chance I, I can deal with this theory, right? So this is a very important expression if you want to do perturbation theory it's a very good way of writing this object which is exact this is exact object i would like to calculate this is exact so far but if i truncate this exponential then i get an approximation as long as powers of the interaction uh, higher powers of the interaction are suppressed somehow right which we'll uh, see later also, this expression can be uh, generalized to uh, more complicated things, right? I could put three, four, five fields here and do all the time orderings. I'll have very similar one expression to this with more fields here, right? I have two here. I end up with two here. And also, I can take more complicated operators. I could define operators which are uh, functions, let's say, of the fields. Right? I could take, for instance, phi square calculated at the same point, at x1. See, that's an operator. And I can write even more complicated operators, right? Like polynomials, even known polynomial ones, but then you have to define them in a series, right? And, 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 and then be careful. But, but you could prove the same thing for any operator, because all you have to do is change that operator from the Heisenberg picture to the interaction picture, you get this UI evolution on, on the left, on the right of that guy. And the rest is the same I did here, right? Just uh, noticing the time ordering and put things together to appear with this evolution from the past into the future, right? So I can easily prove a more general thing, which is this one. Right? This now just any operator, which would be the field, or more complicated combinations of the field and even conjugate momenta, right? In, in any number of fields, any number of these operators that will end up here in an expression that is very useful once you want to do perturbation theory to calculate objects, complicated objects like this. Right? And, and, this is a very important result, and it's called the Feynman theorem, right? Uh, usually you see this one called Feynman theorem, but this is a kind of a generalized version of the Feynman theorem. And many people also call this one Feynman theorem. And, and this is the result we wanted to get to uh, today. So next lecture, we'll take a, a look at another theorem called, called the Wick theorem that allow me once, let's assume for some reason I can truncate this exponential and stop at a power, power series of the field. So I just have a product here of a number of fields, right? How do I calculate this? Is there a practical way of calculating this? And, and Wick's theorem will give us that, but we'll do that next lecture. And then I guess I'll see you then.